Hey, Kieran, welcome to the show. What's up, Brody? Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm really excited about this conversation to dive deep into neuroplasticity, AI, and so many other avenues. But first, starting off, can you tell us a little bit about your story and how you originally got into studying neuroplasticity and AI and all these really interesting subjects? Great place to start. I think before diving deep, I think there is a, a relationship that binds all of the stories of my life. And when I look back onto them, I think of my relationship with learning. I had a very unique relationship with learning all the way back to when I think of being in school and doing exams. I remember writing my name on exams and having this pre-belief of I'm just I'm going to fail anyway. So like whatever. And I, I, I remember I struggled so much. I worked so hard in school to try and get good grades. And I always worked harder than the results I got in the end. And that belief led into university. When I got into university, I, I actually didn't get any of the universities in Ireland at the time. In Ireland, when you're getting into universities, it's very academic. It's only academic. Uh, and I ended up going to Scotland and I actually missed out on one of the grades for Scotland, but I got through because my interview was so good. It was a four or five hour interview. They were very focused on the individual. And so when I was afforded that opportunity, I realized that, oh, this is interesting with how I learn and how I'm perceived in the world. That's very different depending on where my value is noticed and seen. Mm -hmm. And I experienced a flourishing, should we say, in university where I had this same experience with learning, where I would work really hard. I failed at least one thing every year from, for the first three years of university and had to repeat and had to lean on lots of guidance and mentorship from my lecturers who were very supportive and friends. And then in fourth year, I this all goes very hand in hand with another topic and another relationship relationship being the macro word here which is learning but also the relationships in my life especially the loving relationships in my life and when I was in university coming to my fourth year in university I was starting a, a placement in neurosurgery and it was to dictate the, the grade for my entire four years after seven weeks of being there I unfortunately um, I failed uh, I was told by my mentor at the time two days before finishing that look, you're just not good enough. You don't have the grades. And I felt this, this disconnect between learning and between communication and between relationships. The examples of relationships up to then, I had been in relationships, you know, long-term relationships as a teenager, um, in long-term relationships during university that were all quite toxic, quite emotionally abusive, mm -hmm. very unconscious, very, lots of hurt, hurt people, hurting people, you know, yeah. And I, you know, I'm no saint either. There was definitely hurting from my point of view too. And I could see this whole joining and mellowing of my learning experiences through education and relationships, relationships with people and communication and things not working out and me sitting in the middle of that, trying to figure out well, why. This catastrophe happened and it was December finishing and it, it came to January and I don't know what really clicked, but some insight hit me of... I really need this to change. Like I need to, I need to pass this. I've had so much support from loved ones that have invested in me to, you know, get through this. Like I, I and again, I studied occupational therapy at the time. Yeah. And then for that second part of the year, I got all A's. Uh, bar, I think maybe one exam. I came the top percentile in my in my entire course. Wow. I was gifted two awards from the university. One for most likely student to look out for in the future from the graduate course and um, another award as well. And I couldn't believe it. It really didn't make sense to me. It, like the polarity was so different. The relationship between my experience of my effort and outcomes had been so drastically different before and now so drastically different again. It didn't really feel like a natural process. It felt very strange. And then that led me into being very fascinated with 
I guess, hacking learning. Like, how could I understand how to hack a little bit of this? Again, mm -hmm. I was fascinated with neurology because I guess, reflecting back onto it, when you tell a child not to do something, what does the child want to do? It wants to do that thing more. <laughs> Of course. So I naturally had an inclination to want to study neuroscience, neurology. And then two years later, I became a specialist occupational therapist in brain injury and stroke rehab. I had been bitten by the bug of understanding the brain. And the second that I realized that I could harness more of my own story, my experiences, my learning, my struggles, parts of me that I felt like I couldn't communicate to anyone else, that I felt made me naked to the world like we all have these unique stories that are so isolating right yet so yet so joining when, you know when we when we share and speak openly to that mm -hmm. and after i finished ot i got into brain coaching entrepreneurship again you, when when i realized this ability to create and access more of my own inner authenticity my inner home of expression mm -hmm. even to this day i'm still really only trying to define what that home looks like at least in what i'm creating and i've gone from brain coaching doing that for the last number of years and worked in multiple different avenues and then last year applied for a master's which i'm starting in september in artificial intelligence and big data and i moved country i'm living in barcelona now i'm no longer living in the uk and so there are these multiple multiple chapters along with these chapters with learning there has also been a corresponding relationship with relationships, going from toxic relationships to now being in a, you know, a four-year relationship from my, my other half, Jess, which is drastically different, very, very together oriented and very conscious as a relationship. And those are two of the stories, I think, probably why I'm sitting here right now, even speaking to yourself with a lot of the work I'm doing. You know? That's amazing awareness, truthfully so many takeaways and how the values of this took you to this I, I would be so interested to learn about what you actually learned about learning and how you're able to hack your brain so to speak so it'd be interesting to transition into um when you spoke about especially when you spoke about how you went from uh going from basically failing out to in the top percentile let, let's talk about that a little bit and how people can really maximize their uh, learning potential so what are some of the basic foundations that you found radical ownership being one and the reason why i say that is because if we don't have clarity on the root of the problem no, no amount of effort will ever surmount to sustainable long-term changes. And you will end up repeating a pattern of efforting your way out of problems. Or as I say, when I think of a, a lot of the work when speaking to clients is you can't think your way out of a doing problem. You can't think your way out of something when you don't have clarity on what it is you're thinking about. And it requires this level of action. The level of action that I think that was most contributing to that change was that ownership. And then in those actions, what that looked like was seeking guidance from people that were in my life that could provide me with an objective mirror, mirror back to me what reality was, like what is going on for me. And like clearly I've got blind spots. Clearly there are areas of bias that I'm seeing into my experience and what I'm doing that you know, there, there's something amiss here and it can't be up to me to give myself something I don't have, at least in my conscious awareness. And so surrendering to the fact that it's not up to me was one of the biggest changes that actually allowed me move from a place of analysis, paralysis and self-destructive criticism into a space of openness and acceptance to use that energy and move forward which in terms of progress, it, it wasn't zero and one and two and three. It wasn't slow progress. You know, the difference in those few months is that example with uh, my, my time in, during my bachelor's, it was an exponential increase, like in my experience, like it was an exponential curve, an exponential growth in 
whoa, everything I'm seeing is different. How I'm in the entire system of how I experience my world and everyone I'm speaking to and every word I say and every thought that I think of is fundamentally different because of the insights I now have, which would never have come to me if I didn't lean on being open to feedback and open to the areas that required ownership. Wow. Yeah, it's so true. When it comes to human potential and what we're actually capable of doing, it's so the radical, radical, this is my, my doing, my creation. And when you can take on that responsibility that this, everything I've created in my life up to this point was my creation, then you can finally take a deep breath, inhale and say, okay, well, if I created a lot of this crappiness, now let's move on to me create, I'm a creator. I created that crappiness. So if I can create the crappiness, then on the polarity of that other spectrum is the, you know, yin yang. So I can create really positive things in my life if I put the same effort and consciousness in into that. And I wanted to say that uh, when it comes like human potential, what what are your uh, ideas and ideals of where we can actually get to? Like, are we talking about living past a certain amount of years? Are we talking about um, you know, there's already amazing stories of human potential, like Wim Hof, who walked up Everest, like barefooted. And we're talking about um, women that can lift up, uh, a, you know, a 3000 pound car uh, to free their baby. And we're talking guys walking across hot coals. So where can we can we take this as a human race together? Um, and what are some things that you can foresee if we really put our mind to it? Good question. I think context makes um, or has to be at the center of um, how to look at potential. And with, with the, uh, say the examples that you gave there of Wim Hof, of, of that lady lifting that car, of uh, people walking over fire, as an example, for, for someone to place themselves in a position to do something so ex extraordinary, it requires an extraordinary circumstance. And that extraordinary circumstance also produces extraordinary experiences of the neurochemicals that facilitate the body's ability to participate with experience, with the environment based on all of this cocktail of chemistry and cocktail of the relationship between the context. And so when I think anyone listening, when thinking about potential, I think it can be very, and I'm, I'm very much a victim to this with being such a visionary, being able to see invisible things, things that have not happened yet, things that will happen in the future, innovation, design, imagination, fantasy, you know, that's where I, you know, where a, a, a pattern of uh, one of my dominancies would, would usually be. And so I think anyone listening to this, I think it's also important to recognize the context of what those situations are and as they are with a pinch of salt. But in terms of practically applying that to oneself and one's life, I think thinking of the context of your own life, like if you are if you're Wim Hof, why the hell did Wim Hof get into what he does? For the bits of the story I understand, it was the fact that his, his, his partner, his wife, his most loved person in his life at the time passed away. And he had to rear all these kids. He had, again, he was similar to uh, my experience of survival of, oh my God, all of this catastrophe has happened. Another relationship has broken down. I've been kicked out of this placement. My whole life is falling apart. And there is a moment and when those ships are burnt and there is only one option to either take the island or not survive, at least in what you believe to be true in that instant. And so similar for him, it was a similar instance for that lady who lifted up that car, who was trying to protect, say, if it was a child, similar instance. And so these are not everyday examples of how to actualize potential. These are extraordinary circumstances that produce 
you know, one-off extraordinary circumstances. Ten, put a hundred people in Wim Hof's situation, and maybe he was the one lucky person that he was able to produce those behavioral changes, those thought-based changes, to actually manipulate his reality in a positive instance and impact people like he has. Similar to that lady, similar even maybe to myself. And so I think it's very important to take things with a pinch of salt that are not related to your own context, because that is the that is the spice that dictates the flavor of your life. And when actualizing your potential, if your spice of your life, the, the context of your life is not the, at the center of your, how you're relating to opening up to your own potential, then you'll forever live in the cycle of trying to do things based on it working for other people and constantly be disappointed at the fact that your effort is not producing the outcomes you know inherently deep down within you you deserve but in terms of the objective reality that you're living in with the outcomes of i'm still struggling with this behavior i still don't have this relationship i still don't have this job I still don't have this body all of these wants end up masking themselves as needs and the core needs from which one might require, you might require, I might require to really tap into what I would say potential is inner genius. And what I would say inner genius is one's ability to express their unique, their unique ability to turn what we all have between us into something unique based on me as a human, because no one else is Kiron, no one else has experienced the experiences Kiron has. No one has thought the thoughts in a similar way because of the experience I've had. No one has made the choices that I've made based on those similar instances. And so because of that, that also dictates a lot of the flavoring of that meal of my life or that, that optimized meal of my potential. And so think of bringing it down to very simple principles and practical principles, because if it doesn't sound simple, I call it bullshit. And it needs to be simple because if it's not simple, it won't. Thought can't be turned into action. It can't be realized. It can't be uh, from turned from something that is formless in a conversation to something that is formed in the matter of the world we live in. Mm -hmm. And so, I think two principles are really important when opening up to your own potential. One is thinking bigger, like think bigger. Uh, to 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 a, to a size that feels like maybe you'll never even reach that and that's okay but it has to be bigger because if it's not bigger the problems of your daily life will surmount to something that feels a lot heavier than they may actually be and they will weigh you down in your ability to do what is required or to listen and be able to see what is true and what is not true in whatever thoughts come up in the daily experience or whatever behaviors ended up being a pattern that you judge and shame and blame yourself for that gets in the way of that true nature of our being, that true nature of, you know, of who we all are. The second thing then is once having that principle of thinking bigger, really get above, like get into the, you know, as the example, so easy to walk around. I live in a city now. It's so easy to walk around and get caught up in just looking at the buildings. Mm -hmm. caught up in looking at the buildings and seeing all the stress and getting caught up in the in the unconscious nervous system of a city um, my, my pace is faster um, my thinking is faster i feel a little bit more agitated a bit more dysregulated but if i had stopped and just looked up into the sky to see above even as, as i sit here with the window as i see that there are clouds there are there's something bigger always going on by recognizing that instance of truth, that can allow at least me to step into what it looks like in my, in my day. And this is what I would say that the second principle is, is using that awareness and insight to really focus on the quality of how you participate each day in each moment and get super, super curious in how you show up each day. Not so much in your ability to be a high performer or do something to a great degree, but in the quality of how you show up actively in the participation with yourself, with doing the mundane to the exciting. And let that be the core 
relationship you have with yourself in how to actualize your potential because Rome wasn't built in a day, but the only way to eat a big whale is one bite at a time. And so the quality of how you do that is so much more important than the quantity of things you do or the amount of information you gather if it is not specific and individual to the spice, as we mentioned earlier on, the spice of your life, the spice of your nature, of your experiences, of your struggles, of what is going on for you in your experience that is coming up and getting in the way, because that is what matters and that is what will create the most sustainable and most impacting exponential changes for you to actually actualize what you know you have within you in whatever form that might look like for me for you for anyone listening very well said when it comes to the curiosity aspect of life and that spice of life i would love to know what are some things that any of us can do just to remove that limitation of societal expectations and more move towards a place of creating more novelty in our lives? What are uh, some cost effective or easy ways we can really maximize novelty into our life? So this question had me very, very curious and still has me very curious to say it's one of the one of the core questions that got me bitten by neurology and the same instance of that bug now is translated into the bug that's bitten me with artificial intelligence um, since last right. year. But when creating novelty and when trying to tap into our curiosity a little bit more, it is more important now than ever in the world that we live in where artificial intelligence especially is fundamentally changing how we all participate and will participate with the world if it's not felt now as much in whoever's listening in the world you're living in but in the world that we will be living in it will be drastically drastically impacted in so many ways and so now more than ever it is more it, it is so important to access our curiosity through identifying what it is i want and what it is i don't want what it is i know to be true and what it is I, I know not to be true. And getting very core in, in what you believe. Not so much in what you believe with how everything works, but what you believe in what relates to, to you. Mm -hmm. And so coming back to that second principle I had mentioned when really undergoing a journey of cultivating your own potential, bringing it out into the world, bringing out that creative genius that we all have within us is through being very aware of the decisions you make each day and recognizing most importantly, when you feel like you want to do something and why, why do you want to do something? Is it really for the reasons that you want to do it or mm. is it for other reasons? And getting curious, not so much in the why, but in the, in, in the facts, in when I make this decision, what is the experience afterwards? When I, when I participate in whatever behavior, as an example, if I struggle with any form of addiction, we all participate in forms of addiction. If it's addiction, the addiction of thought, whatever we repeat, and whatever that we repeat that we relate to, that afterwards we end up judging ourselves or shaming ourselves or blaming ourselves for, for me, in terms of a thought pattern, it's it, uh, such a perfectionist tendency, such a need for the perfect circumstances or for me to gather all the information or for the situation to be a certain thing before I go and, and take action. And so as a consequence of you know, that, that tendency, what I would say is very addictive in its nature in the relationship with that, because, only because the judgment that would come afterwards, oh, why didn't I do that thing? I said I would do it and I didn't. I'm so lesser of myself. And then the self-doubt comes in and then the self-loathing comes in. And then all of the other behaviors that come to just self-manage myself, if it's staying up late to avoid tomorrow or to stay up later and watch Netflix or 
participate in some form of pr productive procrastination. If it's like, I'll just learn, watch more right. videos or read a book or whatever, but I'm not really doing what it is I want to do. And so what I would say with curiosity is get, getting curious in your relationship with what it is you want to do and then getting curious in looking at how you feel afterwards with doing certain things because if it's leading to a constant cycle of judgment and shaming yourself and blaming yourself well that's going to be the area that will certainly feel like the most difficult place to look but it will most definitely be the place that gives you the most rich unique information that when we come back to that spice, like we said before, that spice of life that you need to have in, 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 to cultivate this meal of your life that is unique to you. That is how you gain more access to that very unique information, those uh, and what that looks like. In the method, I wrote, I wrote a book on this a number of years ago, and it's the method that I, I work with, with, with clients, with the neuro momentum coaching that I do. Mm -hmm. and to build, build like neuroplasticity based momentum with, within the brain is focusing on when those situations occur, especially that hinder uh, our ability to relate to ourselves, judgment and shaming and blaming ourselves is getting curious in what are my, what are my golden tickets? Like the golden tickets of my body, the golden tickets of my thoughts, the golden tickets of my behaviors and begin recognizing and identifying the geography of your experience pinpoint this happens here this thought occurs up in this situation this has also happened a few times this week and get very curious in identifying bringing more awareness to the landscape of your daily experience with your thoughts with your relationship with your body where is this tension showing up why am i feeling this certain way what's it relating to and also then with your behaviors what behaviors am i participating in that are if they feel like i want to do them but when is it I'm wanting to do these things? Is it after a certain stressful conversation? Is it after a certain topic is brought up? Is it a certain time of the day? And so by getting clear on the reality of the geography of your daily experience, you will gain the essential insight that we all require to begin tapping more into our curiosity, tapping more into what we see to be true, what we, what we really value, what we really want to stand for, what really makes me me, and what I want to show up and curiously take action on in the world, not for other people's reasons, but for reasons that are important to me. Because again, with curiosity and attention, if I don't innately have a deep emotional desire or attachment to what it is I'm curious with, then that which I'm curious with may be for reasons that are not my own. And they may be for reasons of of our ego to validate our sense of self-importance or self-worth within the world or how we relate to other people. And so getting very curious in, in that daily dynamic is so unique and so beautiful to each and every one of us, but it is the one factor that I believe to be most true in so many lives that I've, I've seen and worked with and, and certainly with my own experience as well that has made the biggest impact to being able to confidently take action in new novel experiences. Fantastic advice. So many takeaways once again, and but this in itself is making me curious about looking at that bird's eye perspective of, of myself and what I've gone through individually and uniquely what makes me me it's not what society says that having this amount of money is going to bring happiness or having this car all the external stuff but what truly motivates me at, at a deep deep level and that curiosity so thank, thank you so much so much good advice i wanted to move on to ai and how that relates to neuroplasticity because these are two such very interesting topics to me because in my opinion the brain is the epicenter of human potential and what our brain is the ultimate computer and a computer was drafted off of the thought of a brain computerization 
where where are we headed? Because I don't focus so much on AI, but I am curious to understand more about it from a logical perspective instead of getting emotional about this, where we're headed as a society. Um, but just give us some first principle thinking um, thoughts about AI and really what this means to each and every unique individual that's here. I think it's something that I'm still really trying to understand. I think, again, I'm very curious in understanding more of it. And I think everyone should naturally be quite curious in understanding more of it. Mm -hmm. The reason why is because it, it artificial intelligence is like a, an umbrella term for covering multiple different things at once. Mm -hmm. How I understand it to, to be true is that there's so much information in the world that all of the technology that we've participated with over the years, if it's been our smartphones or social medias or uh, banking or finances or everything, everything that uh, all of our behaviors that have been tracked with technology and then all of that data being put together to provide us with everyday solutions that we unconsciously participate with every day when a song gets suggested on Spotify or when um, uh, something is shown to me on a, uh, a Google sheet that I've typed in on a Google search, uh, I should say on, on Google or on Facebook with ads and things, why are certain things showing up for me? And with this similar instance, we've already been participating with AI for such a long time. I think the only difference now is that every single person who has access to the internet now has the opportunity to interact with being able to create at such a more unique level because now we can participate with all that data through a simple conversation chat. You know, as an example with ChatGBT, mm -hmm. the same relationship that we might have with uh, any form of messenger app or you know, having a conversation with someone because all of that data has been trained on what they the, the, in the AI world or in the, the, the tech world is uh, large learning models, large language models, which are basically the, uh, a form of machine learning, at least how I understand it in my, in my new novelty of stepping into this world, a form of machine learning that takes all of the uh, information and data and is able to have an interface with us, have an interaction with us in a more conversational human instance. Because if we didn't have this conversational part, it would be very difficult to relate. And so the computer scientist era of relating to all of uh, this artificial intelligence was, it, it, it made it a lot more difficult to interact. Like you almost had to be, at least how I understand it, like more of a computer scientist or more of a, uh, uh, in that inclination to be able to understand data in such an abstract manner at such a scalable manner to be able to hold all that information at once and then make decisions that are meaningful on that. Now, because we've got these large learning language models, large language models, everyday people who don't have these unique skills or requirements can participate in asking certain questions to gather certain bits of information to create or to ask or to find out in ways that are so instant and so unique and so I think it's a very interesting time to get very curious not so much in where the direction of things are going but more so in how we can interact with these things and I think the thing that makes it at least one of the biggest tools in the arsenal to uh, anyone listening is using that curiosity that we talked about because it's uh, at least how I see it to be true. It's it's not it's not that I think AI will take over as such, but in terms of how we participate in the world, that will that that will change. Not so much in what we do, but in how we use our minds, how we actively have more of a conscious relationship with our mind, so that we can participate in a in a a new and growing way that is a lot more fundamentally based around the questions that we can ask instead of the actions that we do. 
I can type in something on the likes of uh, one, any of these language models, if it's BARD or, uh, um, or chat GPT as an example. And based on the question I ask, I can get a really good quality piece of feedback or insight if I'm using it for professional instances or for me personally, I really love using it for like a hyper learning point of view. I can, I, what I, what would have taken me maybe 10, 15 hours of studying, I could whittle down to maybe a few hours, even less because of how much it can organize things. And, and what I realized was the most important thing, or I think why I have such an inclination with, or such an ability to just feel comfortable in this space, which mm -hmm. is unique. Like I feel, I feel quite comfortable in this, in such complexity because of my relationship with curiosity, mm. because of what I understand to be true, or what I understand to not be true, because of my, you know, in in like my no bullshit radar, like uh, my no bullshit radar is is very high, and so I'm I'm not someone that's easily swayed to believing things. I, I question a lot. It, it takes me a lot for my belief to change about something unless it, it makes sense and I know it to be true. And if not, well. I'm not, it's not, it needs to make sense to me. And so I've gone on a little bit of a ramble here, but I think you know, we're coming back to this fundamental relationship that we have with ourselves is curiosity. If I'm more curious in my own story, I'll naturally be a lot more curious in the story of what's happening inside of me. And AI, at least how I understand it, is a bridge from how we can begin to understand how we participate in the world in ways in which that maybe a lot more aligned in how we would like to participate with the world. But I, I do think that it's a very, very interesting time because it's so new and mm -hmm. there's so much uh, learning that must occur that the, the, I think the biggest priority, at least that I think of, is making sure that the consequences of any learning are not to the detriment of, of, of people that end up suffering more than they have to. And... I think because suffering is a natural part, not suffering, but difficulty and struggle is a natural part of the human experience, more that we can get curious in our own struggles. I think with this world of AI that we're all stepping into, there may be a little bit more of a seamless transition, a little bit of, oh, this, this makes a lot more sense. I can see how I could use this for myself because I'm used to asking myself questions and a little bit more difficult questions. I can use that skill, that association from a neuroplasticity point of view to start taking those associations and start using them in more of these technical aspects of the world around us. Got it. The rate of change is so rapid for so many of us and even people like myself who quite honestly embrace chaos and stress. I embrace it. And to a certain extent, I'm I'm at one point in my life, and maybe still to some extent, am a little bit addicted to uh, stress, stressful situations, and in some extent, and I'm catching myself, which is is the key in improving upon that. But when it comes to AI, how do I think it's it's mainly a with society? There's a big I yes or no or black or white type of thinking with that and I'm trying to draw myself more into the middle and that's my intention but I I started out at first with not curiosity it was more from a fear state but then I also see on the other side of that spectrum AI enthusiasts who believe that it's going to be the blissful um just elevation of human consciousness at a rapid pace so i think where where do you where do you well, on that spectrum where do you find yeah it? I, th I think from me speaking a few moments ago even as i see into me speaking and look at, and just look at that it's very clear to me that i'm i'm still in a place of sitting with and listening okay. and trying to observe it I'm trying to observe the nature of what's going on how am i relating to it like what am i what are my natural inclinations towards what's going on and i'm still forming a lot of my beliefs around how i how i see things will play out i think that's a lot of the reason why i wanted to commit to 
a master's for a year as well is to be in the space like get deep into the space i have lots of uh, very like soft skills you know like soft skills and hard skills that right. i find those so- soft skills being more communication and people related hard skills being more i guess in, in one quote things behind the computer at least how i understand them and so i have lots of soft skills lots and lots of years of soft skills and lots of deep insights into how those soft skills can be translated into my hard skills and how that can be put together into product and into a technology and into a service but i'm also very aware of what i'm ignorantly unaware of which is quite a lot at the moment when it comes to the space which feels again it feels lo- it feels novel and new and not many times or instances do do we get to experience novelty in such a playful childlike way as we grow up usually that uh, that's afforded only when we're younger and then the responsibilities of life and the, the hardships of life certainly fill up the content of our experience and and uh, stress us out mostly during the day but I think that's also something that at least I feel very drawn to with being more in the space is that I feel like there is a lot more natural curiosity that is in that is coming from a space within me that is most consistent with how I show up in my daily experience that I feel, hmm, I, I think I can really create something really amazing here. I think I can really whatever the the creation of the things that I've been creating over the last number of years from moving in occupational therapy to brain coaching to working with different performance avenues to Nike and athletes into working with more coaching services now with mindset plug-in services and supporting lots of clients on a wide scale to how that translates into technology I'm following my curiosity. I feel like I am uh, like Alice on the yellow brick road, just following brick by brick and, and trusting that where that's, where that's taken me from where I was to where I am has led me to live a very incredible experience and that I wouldn't change. And so it excites me to step into this space of, well, if, if we know that anything, at least from a, a quantum space or from a, a, theater, a theoretical scientific standpoint and even a, a spiritual standpoint of things that we don't understand. I think there's a lot of potential to create lots of amazing things in, in this space. And I think there is a unique balance here of it kind of perks my ears up a little bit more that we like the natural tendency is to have a little bit more fear in this area. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm not going to pretend I'm someone that has many, like many uh, uh, core ideas of someone that should be listened to about AI. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> That's right. why I'm getting into this space so I can learn more on that. But what I think is something that's very unique that I think will be beneficial to the human experience is that we are questioning things. Like there is this natural tendency to not believe. Like I, I don't trust that. And maybe for the first time in history, at least how I, I'm, I'm looking into that direction just now, I don't think there's been so, something on such a collective scale that has turned everyone into looking into that same direction of i don't trust that you know usually with uh, religions or ideologies or uh, politics or there's there's pull and again it, you know it's interesting because there's polarity there, there's almost like an ai religion occurring of people that are 100 percent fanatics and others that are completely against it which is right. very similar to relationships with, with religion but in this instance i think that the questioning is a good thing. I think the questioning is a uh, returning back to again, what do I know to be true? Like, what do I, if I if I if I know that there's something out there that's a little bit scarier that I don't want to control me, I want to have more sovereignty over myself. I think innately that can motivate more self inquiry, more questioning with ourselves, more how can I gather more control or agency of myself so that I can navigate this world in a way in which that I'm not learning so much so from the, the these difficult consequences of the, the world that we live in now that is you know, drastically changing in, in, in so many ways. 
Yeah, it's a it's a very very healthy healthy conscious question to question those where it seems like we're being brought by um, these large corporations towards where they would like to go with their magnificent influence. And so it's like, what, what's important to me? And a lot of people are finding that they're finding that going outside makes them a little bit more getting a little more sun makes you feel happy. And, and these are the same thing that our ancestors did. So it, it's all coming back to full circle and that individual um, empowerment that we really can do what we would like to do and um, transitioning once again back to neuroplasticity. I wanted to ask you what are your thoughts around, I always hear about people saying this principle well, work on your weaknesses, or some people say work on your strengths. And from my perspective, I'm a little, I'm balanced. I think that working on your strengths is awesome. What you're innately um, capable, really good at and what you enjoy and your values. But I also see the um, work that can, the immense gratification that you can get from working on some of the things that you're not so good at and not um, innately drawn to. So when it comes to neuroplasticity and maybe a philosophical standpoint, what's your idea on working on our weaknesses um, with neuroplasticity? Mm. That's, like, a, that's I, a great I, question. I, mean, I wanted to point out that math has never been my forte. I think that's really interesting. A lot of the work that I've, got, I've stepped into, which is a lot of the reason why AI was very curious to me on such a wide scale of how how could people, how could we engage with a technology in a way that allows us to be a little bit more aware, a little bit more aware of the things that are already and always happening? And how can we have a bit more of a relationship with that in which we can become more in control and have more consistency within our life in the directions from which we want to step into? With strengths and weaknesses, I think context is very important. And I think for, from one standpoint, I think there's two principles here that really stand out. One, coming back to what I had mentioned for potential, that second standpoint, again, is quite, is quite similar from the thinking big. In this instance, I would say it's more the, the core root of that thinking big, which is what is important to you? Like what is really important to you? And, and when we say important to define that, in how you participate, and this is coming back from when I was working in active neuroplasticity, when I was rehabbing upper limbs and lower limbs as a consequence of stroke or brain injuries and seeing these actual real life changes of someone not being able to use their hand. And after so many sessions, seeing someone go from twinges in their fingers to being able to use something functionally and manipulate it in reality with objects of any shape or size to functionally benefit that person if it's dressing or washing themselves or um, putting on their shoes or doing a, you know, a productive based task. It all very much surrounds itself by what do you enjoy doing? What do you enjoy doing? And, and by understanding what you enjoy doing naturally, we can take those associations from a neuroplasticity point of view and apply that same principle to the things that we inherently may be weaker in our ability to perform at. So the example for yourself, Brody, when it comes to maths, getting curious in the story of my relationship with maths, mm. getting curious in the fact that why is this? What, I, I struggle with this thing because of, because of not with the fact that maths is difficult or, or that anything is difficult per se, but for the fact that the story that I have in how I'm relating to this thing, there is a block. There is a mental block block there is a an inability for me to participate which is blocking my ability to create new synaptic connections to facilitate a a rewiring ability a a ability to create those functional changes and to actually be able to use maths in everyday life and so how i approach this is from three different steps which is very similar to the the method that i wrote about years ago that is still very much the core philosophy of the a lot of the successful outcomes I see when when people 
are able to change the relationship with thought, change the relationship with behaviors, to then put that into the context of the example here of maths of, well, the first principle here in, in this instance from a neuroplasticity standpoint and improving on the weaknesses is the consistency. What is it? What, what is the root of this block? What is the, the core reality of this story I have that is the, the core factor that is getting in the way? So for example, I think this would be a useful thought, thought experiment and uh, maybe quite beneficial as well, um, yeah. a personal standpoint maybe for you yeah. with with maths what is it you feel is the biggest struggle when it comes to the idea of participating in in anything to do with maths so if i draw myself back to when i was young i remember not I was struggling mightily similar to you in school uh with math when it got to calculus i was very uh competent when it came to algebra and um i even did pretty well in statistics uh in college later on but when it came to cracking that code of remaining a uh, high valued student or ap student that they called him at that time i could not it there was a block there and I wasn't keeping up to pace. And then that led to a lot of negativity and just, it became more of a boredom and um, it just became yucky to, to me. There was nothing fun about it at, after that point. Would it be okay to explore a little bit into that story? Are you okay with um, some, some uh, analysis, some insight into, into that experience? Absolutely. So what? So it sounds like that experience of maths resulted in a core relationship with not getting something right, not being able to participate, not being able to either and take a pinch of salt with everything I say and anything that resonates. You know, uh, allow yourself to see into more of that direction. Right. The the moment where you were struggling and not getting the outcome, there was a certain expectation not met. There was a certain sense of um, a certain behavior that occurred either from yourself or from those around you. Maybe it was a teacher that said something. Maybe it was uh, a consequence of say, saying those results to uh, a loved one or a caregiver or how you related it to yourself afterwards. There was an instance, there was a, the same way a light is switched on as a consequence of that core moment happening. There was something that happened there. And mm -hmm. so I would encourage you just now to look into what like what occurred what was the what was the core instance of that moment when you think back to even if you were to close your eyes for a moment and and visualize back to like what is that core memory and, and paint it as uh, as clear as you can see it as you can taste it touch it see it what what what, what is that first experience that comes to you that you feel is the root of that um stressful uncertain experience with maths when was it? Where was it? Who was it with? I'm I'm not seeing anything that's coming up in particular, but I think it was if more of an accumulation of negative experiences that happened. It, it's hard to pinpoint that mm -hmm. precise moment in time for me something that may be more useful again there are multiple ways in which we can self-inquire so if thought is an avenue that isn't providing clarity and getting curious in the body so when you when you feel into that even as those thoughts are repeated of struggling with maths and all of that relationship coming up if you were to pinpoint it as your body as a, a map and the geography of that map, if you were to pinpoint where is that showing up in your, your sensory experience, where is that tension, that heaviness, where is it, where, where is it showing up in your sensory experience within your within your body? It's heart. It's heart. heart. 
anywhere else? Go my go nads, <laughs> in the best way. Mm -hmm. And so, what's very curious there is that when we relate this more to the Western culture of our again where our, where our glands are, which is very curious, that our glands are also in the similar places where our in more of the Eastern philosophies and medicines, there the yogis would say more of our chakras, more of our energy centers, or more of the the centers of where our mind comes from that sets the landscape of our awareness that dictates how we're experiencing our thoughts because of uh, of, of that instance and so pinpointing what that looks like your heart the heart again with our thymus in our chest big area to do with love big area to do with also not being seen not being heard not being validated being felt lesser of, being felt that there is a deep disappointment uh, uh, from what I'm sensing, from what I'm intuiting from that experience. Again, taking everything with a pinch of salt and, and what resonates and what makes sense for you of not feeling, be, being sad that you, being disappointed of not being able to, to meet that standard, to be so curious and be, and felt like that door was blocked off, that I would never be able to, that you would never be able to do this certain thing. And the almost kind of like the grieving of, wow, this is something that is just not gonna be part of my experience. You, you had mentioned as well, going down to your, your test days. Test days is a very important area in terms of safety. In turn, again, when we think more of, when we think more of our self-worth, mm -hmm. we think more of our, sense of grounding, our sense of safety, our sense of where we see ourselves from more of a instance of what feels safe. Like, I don't really feel, I don't, I'm questioning a little bit more. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about not knowing. I know that it doesn't, it feels a certain way. And I don't know, I, I know that it's not a place that I can stay in for long. And so with get it, putting some words to how the body experienced those experiences and how that experience is showing up in your current experience, what do you feel resonates for you most there? What do you feel makes sense? Or, hmm, that is, it sounds like it could be true. When you transition back in time, and especially from that bodily perspective, a lot of insights come up. And so I'll be completely transparent with everybody right here. Um, so I, after I didn't make the basketball team that all my friends were on, I went down a, a, a different pathway. And that pathway was using drugs and alcohol as my avenue um, to relate to the kids in society and to become uh, whatever. And so I... I remember being put in ISS, which is called in-school suspension, um, and it's translated throughout my life. I was put in ISS, and then I was put into um, county jail, for example, for about 60 days um, in my adulthood. And so there, there's something, um, if I can find the root um, of when things started to go icky for me, it was right around the same time as calculus. Uh, being introduced in my life and right around the same time of me being cut for my love at that time, which was basketball. And so that's interesting, isn't it? Because the experiences that we have in these different contexts of our life are certainly, they feel different, but the subconscious is not lied to. The subconscious is this sponge. Our nervous system is this sponge that soaks up every experience. And then our conscious mind has to somehow deal and orientate with each moment to try and see things as separate or feel that things are separate because basketball is different to, or a sport is different to maths. So of course they're not related, but that's, that might be logically, yes, that makes sense. But in terms of what's again very common in the, the world we live in nowadays is intellectualizing our emotional experience through logic but that in its first principle is already setting at a standpoint the relationship of how we're relating to everything from a place that is false because we're not looking at it from more of an emotional point of view we're not looking at it from a point of view of 
the intelligence of our emotions, the intelligence of, and again, our emotions coming through that we experience in our sensory experience and our sensory experience is experienced through our nervous system and our nervous system is connected from our peripheral to our central nervous system up through the more, um, more uh, unconscious parts of the brain and brainstem up into our limbic system and finally up into the conscious part. And so that one little conscious part, that prefrontal cortex that we have, that is, I'm, allowed, I'm putting words to each and every word that I'm saying and I'm speaking in a certain narrative, like I'm speaking just now, doesn't just come from what I'm speaking. It's everything that I'm experiencing right now and how that relates to everything. And so in a similar instance, an insight that I would offer there is, and I think you, you might be seeing that pattern as well. And that in the direction here of the associations of what we experience and how the associations of what we experience also relate to the general experience of our, our life, how that heartbreak in that sport then also as a consequence of another form of rejection in another form of way compounded into this wounding this wounding of love, this wounding of how I show up, this wounding of how I'm seen, of how I'm validated, of how the world is receiving me and how it's not received me. And so what do we do when we're not received? We look to different forms of codependency that we can control to give us that which we don't have, that which we felt like was taken away from us. And so something that I would encourage there, I think mean, this is very similar to, again, a lot of the work that I do with creating clarity through understanding what actually is going on, getting very clear on, on, on what is true and what we are seeing to be true and the differences between those if we're still in a state of disharmony, if we're still in a state of not feeling like we're in that peaceful nature of our being. Because underneath it all, of those experiences like you mentioned, it creates all this context of experience. It creates all this context that our conscious mind focuses on, this big emotional disappointment of sport, this big emotional disappointment of maths. And again, recognize the timeline that the body is in. It was younger, it didn't have the prefrontal cortex as developed. And so the emotions are so much more of a participation in our, in our active experience with going into absolute thinking. This is the way things are. This is the way the world works. This is what it is. And so that representation of those wounds and how they show up in the different contexts of life back then, it's unless looked into from a, a point of view of self-inquiry, that, that, that frame of experience will dictate the subconscious experience of our adulthood, of how we're still relating to our relationships of how we're still relating to if it's sports or even trying to do, still feeling the yearning to do something like maths. Because something that I would challenge is that I think that you have a, a great propensity to be someone that is very good at maths. The reason why is not because you feel like you can't, but because you still feel like you have the curiosity to look into that direction. And I would say that there is innate learning to come from that, not from more of a logical standpoint, from the standpoint of, it being a vehicle for you to turn whatever wounds you're still experiencing in your sensory experience to heal those, to become more of the man that you are in how you express and in how you show up through the vehicle of what inherently you deeply feel curious to understand. For me, it was a similar instance, neurology. Like, wow, I, I messed up. I, I didn't get this placement. I'm not good enough. I'm rejected relationships. When I was uh, I was in multiple multiple different relationships over the last so many years of my of, of my life and quite long relationships between four years and two and a half years and there was lots of toxic patterns and behaviors there was lots of cheating that was experienced from from my end and and, and I was cheated on and and it was so hurtful it was you know again so ripping so crushing so this is how the world is seeing me. This is how, this is what I clearly see to be true. This is what I'm only good enough for. This is what I'm never meant to have. But mm -hmm. if I was to go through that same line of thinking, and if I was to never inquire into the frame of how I'm relating to those experiences, I would still repeat them in my daily experience. Mm -hmm. And so the difference between the neurology standpoint and becoming a specialist, the difference between being in toxic relationships and now being in a, a very giving relationship that is 
beautiful and, and still ever giving, those things only happen as a consequence of that inquiry, not into what works for us, but in what actually hurts. Like where is the core of that wound showing up? What, what is that for me? If it is the examples you gave of basketball and, and, and of maths, I'm sure that experience relates to the dominoes, the domino of experiences that you went through that you struggle with that all are very similar with that sensory experience right now of where that's showing up from the heart and down deeper into the test days, into that center of grounding, of belonging, of here, of, of, of here-ness. Yeah, as men, we need, there's more conversations that would be beneficial for, to be occurring. Just the vulnerability is, is so 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 important and if i ever have kids then i hope they're growing up in a world where conversations like this are the normal and we're going out on the street and we're talking about these things not with no judgment no shame but vulnerability openness and honesty um so the last, I know it's been quite some some time. I, I want to just transition a little bit into my last question, which is more philosophical in nature. When it comes to our ancestral code, we we have this epigenetic code that's it's running through our blood and our veins and pulsing through us in every uh, second in time. How much? How do we truly, it's talked about a lot, but how can it actually be actually be applied, us healing our ancestral code of, of what our ancestors that are in my blood, you know, scientifically proven that they went through some tough times. I'm here in this time of AI and I'm going through my own struggles, but how how can we just move back in space and time and, and try to heal some of, of these, these traumas that seem to, as you talk about, seem to be reoccurring through my bloodline. I think that's very curious. I think I'll mention something that we discussed already, which is that first principle, lack of potential of bigger, recognizing that what that means when it, it when we look into something a little bit more beyond, when I look into the sky and it places me in this state of contemplation of more, of moreness. Mm -hmm. And when thinking, it can be quite daunting when thinking of everything at once, with the whole world of technology and the whole world of the things I struggle with and, and, and where that comes from. But something that I think can be very encouraging is updating the, the core software of how we, how we relate to what it means to think clearly, which is to, to recognize that everything is deeply connected, everything. In the similar instance of you being here and how many generations of generations of generations of generations of people had to produce previous people for you to be produced, for you to be here <laughs> in, the, in, in in this timeline for all of those experiences to capitulate into other experiences and all of those times being in such a world that has been depending on where it is in the world that we are and what we are and where we've come from and the, the struggles that we've come from depending on where it is you know we, we've shown up in this in this rock flying through space is recognizing that there is a bigger story going on. There is a capital S story, a story of, of the life of the, the lineage of, of, of my humans, mm -hmm. of who has come from me. And recognizing that I, as I am right here in this body is not, I didn't create this body. Like I didn't, I didn't do all the things to do that. My, my parents had to live a life for them to come to a place where then they ended up having me and then, so there was a, there was a there was an interconnection there. There was a whole experience. There was a whole book that happened. There was a, a people's lives that occurred that created the life that is occurring right now and is living, to then potentially create another life before moving on into the formless space again. 
And recognizing that that, is, uh, that we know that to be true is very important for grounding ourselves in core principles about what to do about that and what it means with what to prioritize and what to look at. And again, coming back to something that we've discussed, I think one of the core uh, protocols that um, I teach is on and the first protocol being consistency. What is the one thing that I can focus on today that is showing up in my experience that is, has shown up multiple times in my experience that has been difficult? We're all, we're all going to have them. Maybe it's you're struggling to get up in the morning and you want to get up in the morning, but you're always getting up late or you want to start that, that new business or that you want to uh, do that new hobby or you want to speak to that new person, whatever it might be. You want to stop any form of behavior that you're struggling with. If it's smoking, if it's drugs, if it's alcohol, if it's porn, if it's any form of a uh, behavior that you participate in that you judge yourself for, getting curious in the consistency of how that's showing up. And then getting curious in what is that story and getting curious in how that shows up in behaviors. Again, getting very tangible and practical with the simpleness of life simpleness of life is that I go to bed, I get up, I go to the toilet, maybe I'll be on my phone, maybe I will speak to someone, maybe I will do a job that I have to do, maybe I will participate in some formal activities in the, in the house, maybe I'll go for a walk, maybe I'll go for a shit, you know, we're like we do these, we all do these simple things of life that occur. And so getting curious in, in, in that simpleness of life and recognizing where in your behaviors does it feel like complexity is showing up in the simpleness of your life? Where does it feel like the complexity is showing up in the experience of your thoughts? And when is that showing up? When is the complexity of the tension within your body showing up in your daily experience? And so by focusing on that protocol with protocol one with consistency, and to do that, it's very important that there's a second standpoint from a neuroplasticity point of view, which is to regulate, like to recognize that if I'm going to think about and look at things that inherently are vulnerable to me, I must also recognize that the fundamental nature of the nervous system's experience is that when I think of things that stress me out, things stress me out. Yeah. And so as a, con as a consequence of that, I must also upskill myself in the tools of how to regulate my nervous system because that will give me the most again that protocol two will help me most to continue doing protocol one that protocol two of improving my ability to emotionally regulate myself will help me to continually participate in the consistency of that self-inquiry of my own narrative that will then allow me to do the third part which is usually the third part of the journey of any group or one-to-one -one work I've done over the last number of years, which is the confidence part, which is your ability to confidently take action, confidently do things. And again, this all relates to the first part here of consistency relates to, from a neuroplasticity standpoint, to rewire, to rewire the structures that are currently dictating my experience into protocol two of control, which is really regulating, like regulating my experience when I'm, when I'm beginning to unwire to rewire these patterns of how my brain is relating to thoughts and behaviors to then through repetition of protocol one and two i can then participate more confidently in my daily experience to challenge what i usually do to begin doing more novel things to begin doing new things that show up for me that i feel inclined to do that actually make me feel good about my experience that actually inspire me that actually bring me to a space that i can look up into the sky and think of more and not get caught up in the context of the stresses of daily life when thinking about everything I struggle with and getting so bogged down with the thought of where the hell I've come from and everyone struggles and all those patterns and what's going on in the world and oh my god it seems so crazy and technology and I just don't know what to do and so with getting to a place with what to do at least in my experience from the research from the work I've done from the work I'm doing that is what I have seen to be most true and most effective in sustainable behavior change and sustainable changes to rewire the brain from a neuroplasticity standpoint. And I can say that in not a theoretical sense, but also in a practice sense with the work I've done 
and the practical sense of the work I do with myself and the life I live with the relationship I have and the relationship that I have with myself and the stories that I've overcome and that if I had not stepped more into that journey with myself, I would still be working in a hospital in brain injury and stroke rehab and thinking that that is it. Like I have no, I, that is the limit from which I can serve. That is, that is the, 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 the and again, every, everyone's context is different. If that serves you, amazing, but that did not serve me. There was more, I knew there was another space from which I felt called to serving. That I felt I could learn the most about myself, have an incredible experience for the number of years that we're here before we flash back into dust. And so by stepping more into that space, now I'm doing artificial intelligence. I've gone from a whole entrepreneurial journey and a brain coaching journey and an incredible relationship, living in a new country that has a different language with different people and all of these things when we begin to apply neuroplasticity to our life there really is a ever-ending story of the book of you that you begin to write each and every day. And it's in that active participation of writing and rewiring and regulating, you can begin to see fundamental shifts in your experience a lot sooner than you might realize. That's fantastic. I've, I've learned so much and the main thing take away from me at the end of this conversation is I used to receive the advice to question everything but now instead of questioning only questioning everything it's going to be question everything including your thoughts your behaviors your actions society etc with curiosity with curiosity and just I, I love very, that very beautiful thing i love that and that's fundamental by the way you, you've got you've hit that the nail on the head because that as the root the questioning must come from a place of curiosity because when we look at things curiously we come from a place of love and if i'm just coming from a place of questioning because of skepticism i'm coming from a place of scarcity and that place is void of love. That place is full of judgment, full of comparison, full of guilt, full of shame, full of I am nothing, I am worthy of nothing, I am not able. And so that is the fundamental aspect. I think you hit that absolutely the nail on the head. You question yourself, but question through the eyes of curiosity so you can be through your experience of participating with love, like what it means to experience curiosity through love. I think that's really powerful. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on, Kieran. And I would, for the listeners, can you give them an avenue where they can reach out to you um, and find out more about your work and what you're involved in? Find me on Instagram, and Instagram is where I'm mostly at. I've taken a little bit of a hiatus on and off since moving to Barcelona on social media and getting myself ready for this. And, uh, masters and putting myself in a space of thought and consideration and taking on this new endeavor biting off this parts of this big whale um instagram is where you can find me most i have a website on that that i will be populating a lot more of these insights that i have um not had online um ever before so there is lots of new insights coming out each week um which is exciting otherwise uh, i'm also on linkedin and i'm also on tiktok where i go live quite often on tiktok as well and um, you can also get me on on those socials at Kieran Fox Brain Coach C I A R A N F O X and Brain yeah. Coach. Fantastic. And lastly, can you leave us with a last sentence, word, paragraph, uh, or thesis <laughs> mm. to crystallize the, the conversation we've had and put a title on that essay? Question with an open heart and believe in the possibility that you are worth everything that you possibly desire. I love it. Thank you, Kieran. Pleasure, Rory. <laughs>